Thanks, Paul, and uh, thanks, Mike, for uh, arranging this. Thanks to the Internet Society uh, chapter of the Bay Area. Uh, CDT um, has a, a perspective and a, and a mission that is in many ways similar to the um, ISOC mission, and we've uh, known and admired the work of ISOC uh, for many, many years. I participated uh, in INET uh, 2001, uh, which was in uh, Stockholm, which was an ISOC-sponsored ISOC, uh, educational event, and uh, ever since then, we've had a good, uh, close relationship with ISOC. CDT's motto is keeping the internet open, innovative, and free, which in uh, many ways uh, echoes some of the themes that Paul talked about. And as Paul said, and this is an issue that we're grappling with as well, cybersecurity is clearly an umbrella term which covers a range of issues. I'm not going to start out today by trying to define cybersecurity. I'll let uh, my understanding of the term, at least as I'm talking about it today, emerge organically from what I talk about. And we're certainly free to uh, talk further about what is properly to be considered within and without uh, the, the definition of cybersecurity. My focus today is going to be on the question of what should be the role of the government and what should be the role of government law policy in promoting cybersecurity. And particularly, I'm going to answer that question basically with what I think of as a report from Washington. I now uh, live in San Francisco and have been out here for a while and I'm delighted to, to be uh, in California, but sort of my DNA was formed in Washington, D.C., and I still spend a lot of time in D.C., and I spend a lot of time thinking and worrying about what's going on in D.C., and so to the extent that I have any area of expertise at all, it's in this sort of very strange, sometimes very hot, sometimes hard to understand process of how we make a law, how we make policy affecting something like the Internet. And I think this is critical um, for the Internet Society because, to my view, one of the functions that the Internet Society does is to build a bridge between technologists and policymakers, between those who are building this technology, who are creating uh, companies, creating standards, creating products, and those who are looking at, well, what is the legal environment and what is this framework and it's not easy but we have to find ways to have technologists understand policy policymakers understand technology there are uh, some who can speak both languages i think we need more people who can speak both languages somebody like vince cerf obviously uh, one of the sort of paragons of uh, uh, an individual who, who can speak both languages and who can take complicated technological concepts and principles and put them into a context that a policymaker can understand. Coming at it from a policy perspective, not a technical perspective, <laughs> excuse me, not a technological perspective, coming at it from a policy perspective, I'm going to try today to. Um, Excuse me. I'm going to try today to uh, help you bridge that gap a little bit. Are we okay there, Paul? Yes. Good. So my, four, my umbrella question is, what is uh, the role of the government? Uh, under that, I'm going to talk about three or four other issues. One. What should be the regulatory role of the government? We are having problems here. Particular apologies to those of you who are online, because um, if you've got your headphones on, you're getting a bit of a shock. All right. Let's, let's hope that works. Apologies to anybody who's using headphones. 
What should be the role of the government? Within the government, what should be the respective roles of the civilian components versus the military components? What is the role that uh, regulation plays in this process? What is the role that information sharing uh, plays? And then finally, an issue that I think is going to be a subject of some considerable discussion this year, which is a whole question of countermeasures and what kinds of active defense, you might call it, or countermeasures. Uh, <coughs> Some people pejoratively talk about hackback, but what kinds of um, functions should be permitted to a network operator, a systems operator, outside of their firewall, so to speak? So first of all, the role of the government. Um, clearly the government, and there's no dispute over the fact that the government needs to do a better job of protecting its own networks and systems. There's, I think, no debate in Washington that government agencies, network operators within government have the right to monitor their networks, just as any one of us, CDT, monitors its network. Each of you quite possibly monitor your home network, certainly in an institution that you might work in. There are people monitoring ingress and egress to your own network. The government as a systems operator, a network operator, provider of service to itself, monitors what comes in and what goes out of its um, systems. And the law, to my mind, is quite clear that every systems operator has that sort of self-protective, self-defensive, protect your rights and property is the language of the statute, authority to monitor your own systems. The big question and the question for debate has been, what, if anything, should be the role of the government in monitoring the private networks? What happens when you go beyond .mil, beyond .gov, and how deeply, two separate questions there. One, should the government be monitoring uh, traffic in and out of a private enterprise to protect that private enterprise? Secondly, how deeply can the government go into the private side of the network, the AT&T side, the Verizon side of the network, in order to protect its systems? So the government makes the argument that it's not sufficient to simply stand at that dividing line to the extent you can find it between here we are .gov, here we are private sector, we'll stand on the wall in between, the government has argued that it needs to get deeper into the private side of the network to monitor traffic coming into the government, but to catch certain things, stop certain things before they actually hit uh, the, government, um, the government box, the government device, the government network. I don't suppose they're volunteering to let the private side go into the government side to protect themselves from stuff coming from governments, are they? No, which raises an interesting question about, again, why not simply maintain that dividing line? The government protects its side, the private sector protects its side. And certainly the private sector, as I said, has, in my view, plenary legal authority to monitor its own networks. Clearly the ISPs do that on a network basis, monitor their own networks traffic-wise and deep six a fair amount of stuff that they, they find. And they're permitted to do so. The government has moved into the private sector to protect certain assets in which the government has a special interest. It began with what is called the DIB pilot, Defense Industrial Base Pilot. The theory here was that a Lockheed Martin, um, certain other defense contractors are hosting clearly and working on a lot of highly sensitive information for the government. They are government contractors and that the government has an interest in protecting traffic to and from a Lockheed Martin system, uh, another defense contractor system. And 
Therefore, several years ago, the government launched the so-called DIB pilot. Now, in my view, the DIB pilot was actually a good solution to a conundrum that had plagued the cybersecurity field up until then, which was the view was that the government, because of its intelligence capabilities, has certain unique insights into threats, sources of threats, um, and other uh, threat-related, cybersecurity-related matters. The government's argument was we can't give that to the private sector because it's classified and the private sector will not be trusted with it. Therefore, the argument was let us get into the private sector. We'll put our box on the private side of the network so that we can monitor this traffic. Finally, two or three years ago, there was a breakthrough, in, to my mind. I'll be interested to see what your thoughts are. But the government finally concluded, no, we can't trust the private sector. And we can work with the tier one providers. They have employees that are trustworthy. We can go through the security clearance process with those employees. And the government can provide whatever secret insights it has to the private sector. And the private sector would first use it only in protecting these DIB, defense industrial base, entities. Where, after all, if you're working for Raytheon, if you're working for Lockheed Martin, you've already consented to the monitoring of your traffic. You're already under various kinds of obligations in terms of cybersecurity as well as other kinds of security. And therefore, to put a box, and, and AT&T already has a contract with Raytheon in which AT&T is promising to provide certain special security services to Raytheon. So let's augment the capability of the private sector to protect itself using the governmental secret sauce, any special insights that the government might have. That was implemented. It has now been expanded beyond the defense industrial base to the financial sector, and there are plans underway, or perhaps already being implemented, to expand it to other critical infrastructures. Whereas I say, you know, if you are the working in a nuclear power plant and you're on a computer, you really don't have a right to be going to Facebook or while you're sitting at your terminal in work. So you've already got legitimate constraints on a person's ability to use their work computer on work time at work, particularly in, in a controlled environment. So my feeling was this is far better to empower the private sector to protect itself than to put the government box into the network. The one unresolved issue there, or the one difficult issue there that I see, again, others may see other issues. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to take questions as I go along. Um, is what does the private sector report back to the government? And obviously, there's some legitimate interest if you've got signatures or other parameters that the government is providing which get loaded into the uh, network monitoring capabilities of the service provider. There's a certain legitimate need to report back to the government, hey, we got lots of hits on this one, or this one uh, was over-inclusive, or this, this particular signature that you gave us really didn't work or it produced too many false positives. So there's some desire to be reporting back to the government. On the other hand, as, as you know better than I do, a lot of this security monitoring is becoming real time. It's become automatic. The reporting process back is becoming automatic. And so you can easily see a situation in which government taking signatures, giving them to the private sector for the private sector to use in private to private traffic. After all, it's not unheard of that people at Raytheon will send emails to their spouses um, using their Raytheon address. Um, not, not, not meaning to pick on Raytheon, but in a private sector company. Um, so you're talking private to private traffic now being monitored by the government with signatures provided by the government in an automated process that's not necessarily transparent 
to the network operator, let alone to the service provider. There is consent probably by the employee who is a condition of employment has consented to this form of monitoring. So in, in that sense, it is um, authorized. And there is a concern that this would be used in a way that then serves certain additional intelligence gathering uh, needs of the government or that this information, once provided to the government, can then be used for other purposes. Not yet fully a problem that is not yet fully resolved. So you have that hard set of issues around monitoring. For now, it is the position of the US government, the position of the president, that the government does not monitor private sector networks, with then this caveat that if it's traffic to or from a uh, critical infrastructure, the government will provide assistance to the private um, network in order to uh, augment their capabilities. We'll get later to the question of um, what additionally can the private sector share with the government, which has been the focus of debate around the CISPA legislation. Another question with respect to role of government is then, OK, we're going to provide some information. We're going to monitor certain um, critical infrastructures where there's the consent of the monitor, at least one party consent of the protected entity uh, consenting. What, if anything, should the government do as a regulatory matter to improve the security of the private sector. Again, the government already has a hard enough time protecting its own networks. There it has the procurement power and can use the procurement power to set standards and specifications and write out of the box settings. And a whole lot of work has been done there to increase the security of governmental systems through the procurement process. But what, if anything, should be the role of the government in setting standards or criteria? This has proven to be a very hot button issue in Washington. And you see two different approaches to it. Um, you see what I would call the House of Representatives approach. And then you see an approach taken by the Senate Democrats and by the President. The House. Uh, position has been no regulation, period. Certainly, there's a very strong industry. Chamber of Commerce uh, has led this. A very strong industry position, no regulation, and nothing that comes close to regulation. And there's a very powerful argument for that position, namely the government is not in a good position to know what's going to work, what won't work. Government regulatory structures are not agile. They're not uh, well suited to the diversity of the network. And the government regulation can actually end up being a straitjacket and can end up impeding innovation and could actually end up uh, being counterproductive. The Senate, and mainly the Senate Democratic approach, position in the leading bill in the Senate, which was primarily supported by Democrats last year with uh, one or two Republicans, and the position of the president has been there should be some role for the government, if not a hard regulatory role, then some soft regulatory role for the government to either encourage or incentivize or promote increased private sector cyber uh, security. And so in February, after the legislative process had become gridlocked, the president um, issued an executive order on improving critical infrastructure cybersecurity. It had a provision on information sharing which basically endorsed, not, if not by name, endorsed the DIB concept 
and pushed for its expansion, basically saying that the intelligence agencies and other government agencies should do more sharing of any information they have to the private sector so the private sector can do a better job of defending their own networks. Secondly, it directed the Secretary of Commerce to lead the development of a cyber security framework through a consultative process with um, the private sector. It's got a lot of words here, but let me just read it to you. The cybersecurity framework shall include a set of standards, methodologies, procedures, and processes that align policy, business, and technological approaches to address cyber risks. It shall provide a prioritized, flexible, repeatable, performance-based, and cost-effective approach to help owners and operators of critical infrastructure identify, assess, and manage cyber risk. So that's about as non-regulatory as you can get while still having some yeah. role for the government. It's kind of a best practice. It's a best practices I approach. Several hours of that Secondly, it says that the secretary, in coordination with the sector-specific agencies, because after all, we already have somebody who regulates nuclear power plants, we have somebody who regulates the banks, we have somebody who regulates the telecommunications industry, we have somebody who regulates the transportation industry, all of which after all have safety standards for a whole bunch of reasons and tell you how high the fence has to be outside the power plant and um, tells you how, uh, you know, to protect other aspects of their uh, infrastructure. The secretary, in coordination with sector-specific agencies, shall establish a voluntary program, voluntary, to support the adoption of the framework. Then next, it says, the secretary shall use a risk-based approach to identify critical infrastructure where cybersecurity a failure could result in a catastrophic a regional or national effect on public health or safety economic security or national security. And then finally, agencies with responsibility for regulating the security of critical infrastructure shall engage in a consultative process to determine if current cybersecurity requirements are sufficient and if not to consider whether to increase their existing regulations. So pushing it out to the sector-specific agencies which has the logic of saying, rather than having a top-down, one-size-fits-all, which clearly doesn't work, let's take the agencies that already have expertise, the agencies that are already regulating the banks, which already have adopted some kind of security rules, let them look at their cybersecurity rules, the um, federal agencies responsible for energy uh, regulation, look at energy sector, et cetera, et cetera. That is roughly what the Senate bill said. So in a way, the president, by executive order, has ordered that which the Senate bill would have done on uh, the regulation question. Relatively light hand, working through the sector-specific regulatory agencies. There is ongoing discussion in the Senate about whether that should be codified. So the question is, that if the president's already done it, why have a bill anyhow? The response to that is, well, a presidential order can be changed. Let's codify it and um, put it in place. I actually don't know, and I have no prediction at all, um, whether that will carry the, the day or not. Um, you know, I know, we all know, just from reading the papers, how hard it is to get anything through Congress these days. Um, I think the inertia factor alone would um, militate against anything further on this issue. But on the regulation question, I think that's more or less where we stand, that what you see in the executive order is about where federal policy will be now uh, for the coming uh, five years. And you could easily say, well, let's at least let's see if this works or not, what problems does it raise, et cetera. So let's, let's at least test what has been put on the, the table. 
um, good, bad, or indifferent. Let's at least test, test this. Now, let's get back to the question of information sharing. There are really three aspects to the information sharing question. What should the government share with the private sector? What can the private sector share with each other? And what should the private sector share with the government? Point number one, again, what should the government share with the private sector in a way that's already been answered in the president has now directed the agencies to share as much as they can with the private sector. And there's really not much more that Congress can do, in my view, on that issue. The president has already said it's the policy of the United States to share intelligence information with the private sector to empower them. It's a question of how far, how deep do you go? Who do you trust with that information? The question of what do you feed back to the government? But the, from the government to the private sector question is answered. Peer to peer. Now here's where we get to an area where I do believe that if you want to have a change, you're going to need legislation. And this is where we get into the issue that has preoccupied most of the debate in Congress now for the past several years, and which is the subject of CISPA, the um, Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, which is the legislation now passed a second time by the House and um, now for a second time pending in the Senate with its future unclear. Um, the privacy laws right now, as I said, they allow any system operator to monitor his or her, their own system, and to use that information to protect the rights and property of the system operator. There's an, actually an interesting question under the law as to whether you can share that with another entity for mutual self-protection or for that other entity's benefit to protect themselves. Now there is, and I think it's legitimate and appropriate, some already peer-to-peer -peer sharing that goes on, um, certainly at an informal level. It's not, by and large, automated. It's not robust. It's my view, it's the CDT view, that we could have much more robust peer-to-peer -peer information sharing between private sector entities. Hey, I'm seeing this on my system. Are you seeing the same thing on yours? This is what we're discovering. This is how we responded to it. Ship over the malware. Yes, you are shipping personally identifiable information. At CDT, we have no problem with that. Where you are sharing that information for cybersecurity purposes, where there's some kind of um, limit on the use of that information, and it's being shared to be used for protecting your rights and the rights and property of another service provider that you're sharing it with. And where you're making reasonable efforts to ensure that you're not sharing too much information surrounding the malware and that you're not spilling over into um, monitoring and disclosure of innocent traffic. The harder question is, what gets shared from the private sector to the government, particularly in an era of big data analytic capabilities, particularly in an era of automated um, detection and sharing. And this is really the issue that has hung up federal legislation on information sharing. In our view, in CDT's view, progress was made in the CISPA legislation as it moved through the legislative process this year. And it's sausage making, but it got very complicated, but various limits and clarifications were put into that bill. First of all, a very important issue question I outlined at the beginning, within the government, what should be the respective roles of the military, namely the National Security Agency, 
versus the civilian agencies, particularly DHS. It has been the policy of the United States government now for 20 years, if not longer, going back really to the 1980s, so 30 years now, that civilian cybersecurity should be the responsibility of a civilian agency. DOD, NSA protects .mil, they protect the national security intelligence assets of the country. They are not uh, responsible for protecting the civilian government infrastructure, let alone for protecting the public, uh, privately owned, non-governmental infrastructure. Clearly they have expertise, clearly we want to crack this problem of how do you get the NSA expertise to the private sector. Clearly it's not, in our view, clear. It's clear in our view that you don't want to say never. Google was apparently hacked by the Chinese or by some attack coming from China. In our view, it was appropriate for Google to go to NSA and say, we think this is what happened. We th think this is how they got in. We think we've cleaned it up. We, th we think we're okay now. Have you seen this? Did we do the right thing? Are we correctly interpreting what happened to our system? Can you help us make sure we've gotten the, all the bad stuff out and that we've um, adequately protected ourselves against a similar attack in the future? That's an appropriate, in our view, way of the private sector relating to NSA. Less clear is regular data flows to the NSA. The NSA appropriately might monitor government information systems, clearly .mil, under a constant attack. That's one of the two missions of the NSA is the protective side, but it's been the policy of the United States and the sort of question up for grabs on a periodic basis is what should be the role of the NSA for the non-military, non-defense, non-intelligence assets of the federal government. The position of the White House is uh, NSA should stay with on the military side and the DHS should have the lead on the civilian side. Position of the Senate is that DHS should have the lead on the civilian side. And in the floor vote on uh, CISPA uh, two months ago, the House adopted an amendment that basically ratified the primacy of DHS vis-a-vis -vis the civilian side and the private sector, and said that information sharing to the government should flow through DHS, and then any sharing with NSA should be subject to rules adopted jointly by DHS, the Justice Department, uh, the Department of Defense, and the Director of National Intelligence. One small question in the bill, though, um, the bill does say that any information going to NSA, uh, to DHS should be shared, it says uh, DHS shall ensure that cyber threat information shared with it or any other department of the federal government is also shared with departments and agencies with the national security mission in real time. The Senate bill says in near real time. Um, in real time, the question there is how do you impose a control? What kind of control do you impose? Shouldn't an analyst look at some of this stuff before it goes to NSA? Again, interesting question that we can uh, debate. In a second, I'm going to show you some legislative language because I think it's important for you to appreciate just how hard it is to translate these concepts into legislative language. I want to touch on uh, the issue of countermeasures. And this is an issue that's going to loom large, larger in the, um, this year, in the debate. The House bill has no overt language on countermeasures, although I'll show you where there's some language for worry in a second. The Senate bill last year 
did have language <coughs> authorizing companies, any company, to modify the power to modify or block traffic, modify or block traffic to protect its rights or properties, its rights or property. Now, it was to modify or block traffic on its own network. Since then, some very interesting questions have been raised and are being debated right now. And again, people are struggling to develop the language here to address some of the more aggressive um, tactics. I think the authority to modify or block would probably include what some call sinkholing, taking traffic. Uh, company A is a victim of a denial service attack. They identify the IP addresses from which the attack is coming. They alert their ISP. The ISP diverts that traffic off into a sinkhole where it does no damage until someone can have time to stop the attack and alert the ISPs, which are often innocent computers, of course, that have been taken over. But isn't that their already general practice today? That is. That is. And so that would be ratified, I think, in the Senate bill, although already those companies believe that they have, through their terms of service, the authority to do that because nobody has Every term of service basically says you, you, you cannot use our service to attack somebody else in more or less that language. So the service provider already has the authority to do that. Uh, that that's only the source service provider, not the recipient, though, by that definition. That, the source can certainly cut off abusive traffic coming from its customers, but the recipient not according to your definition. Exactly. Here. So then the question becomes, what can the recipient of the traffic do? Um, what about the brokers that you spun out? Well, that's a whole different story. Because they analyze traffic and then they tell you, well, <coughs> you have bad reputation, or it's up to you to do whatever you want. Jim, and it, can you either repeat the question, or we do have a mic for the audience. Oh, OK. The, 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 the question was about an organization like Spam House which issues judgments, in essence, on traffic, which then again, ISPs either use or don't use to block traffic coming from that address or meeting other identifying criteria that Spam House has generated. That's all voluntary, and it's all done based on terms of service and based upon the authority of the ISP to make a choice. We will or we will not allow this to go through. And one of the sources they might use in making that judgment would be the, the postings, the, the list generated by, by Spam House. And currently, that, that works under the concept of contract without really any, simply the, the consent of the, the user through the terms of service. I, I'd be surprised if the recipient didn't also have that authority because Absolutely. I would expect that all of the curing agreements would include a, 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 a clause to the effect as well. That we will not deliver traffic. So we will not let you send traffic, but we will also not pass on traffic. Right. That is, yes. Yes. Right. So, I mean, this is an example of, it, it seems to be handled well contractually. Why do we need legislation? Well, interesting question. Exactly. There are also third-party service providers that protect against denial of service that aren't ISPs, but, but then you have a contract with them and they'll absorb all the traffic you need to if it, if it happens. And that's a growing area. Uh, so then it gets more complicated when the... Well, but that goes back to the question is why a legislative solution when it's already handled under contract? And I think that though will be people, and this is the perennial way that this debate plays out, which is we're doing it now, but we're worried about liability. 
therefore we need legislation to make it clear that what we're doing is lawful because we're worried that we might get sued by somebody. The contract law does not supersede the antitrust rules. And there has always been some worry about antitrust, exactly, which was a interesting issue that um, plagued the anti-spyware area, and to some extent still plagues the antivirus, anti-spyware sort of um, industry, because basically what you are doing is, is you're taking some people's business model, business models and saying we will not allow you to do a download onto a user's computer because it's without permission or the permission is not properly obtained and so what gets blacklisted in the antivirus software there was a concern at one point that um, the basically whether it was legitimate or not the concern that the spyware makers or the mail malware makers would sue for interference with business model because their ability to download stuff onto users' computers was being blocked. That was resolved, again, without legislation, largely by that industry coming up with objective standards that defined what is an acceptable download and what isn't. And you make you know, your product upgrades permissible, you make your malware impermissible, but you do it on the basis of objective criteria. So again, that's, it, and they were able to do that without running afoul of the antitrust laws. And I'm not an antitrust expert, so I better not go any further than that. But that problem has been solved in the... Well, I was thinking more about the question of sharing information, for example, Symantec and, and uh, What's the name of the other companies? Right. Sharing the information they have about threats. Right? That's what I was thinking about is the spyware analogy to network sharing right. of threat information right. 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 that might be right. subject to antitrust. To and that's been one of the concerns. So, is it um, antitrust or racketeering and collusion that you're concerned about there? Oh, sorry. Well, if it's if it's Symantec or the network providers, I'm worried about them. I'm worried about them being challenged based on antitrust law. It's like monitoring the weather, though. I mean, it's not exactly proprietary. Um, so this is where it's the network might want to take it to court and find that one out. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it, 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 if, there you, if you detect a piece of malware and you share the signature with other people. Uh, so that they can update their product and be able to detect it. And if this group is restricted, then we may be creating a trust. Oh, if it's restricted. So this is where then you try to translate this into legislative language. And this is what the House has come up with. And it starts out with precisely this question. Are we worried about the privacy laws? Is it antitrust matter? Is it um, some other law that might limit this? So the House was pushed to notwithstanding any other provision of law, which is sort of you know the nuclear option for legislative rulemaking. So we're going to, for this purpose, wipe out anything else that we've built up over the years in the area of privacy or um, antitrust or um, other areas of negligence or liability, et cetera. Notwithstanding any other provision of law, a cybersecurity provider may, for cybersecurity purposes, use cybersecurity systems to identify and obtain cyber threat information and share such cyber threat information with any other entity, including the Department of Homeland Security and Justice Department, which then may share it with other government agencies. 
Um, cyber security systems. This is all very nice in a US centric world, but what about dealing with customers and um, data that doesn't happen to originate within the 50 United States? So this raises one of the hardest questions of all in internet policy generally, which is how do you set national law for a transborder or borderless right. ecosystem? Yes. And you know, seven or eight years ago, the American Bar Association launched a massive study of this issue. And they produced a 380-page report in which their conclusion was there will likely be more than one jurisdiction, government, claiming jurisdiction over the same act or the same data over the same assets. And there is no one-size-fits-all rule for deciding which claims of jurisdiction are legitimate and which aren't. Just in the area of consumer um, B2C relationships, there was something called the Hague Convention, which tried to develop rules for B2C relationships in a transborder environment, both for real world as well as virtual world. Failed entirely, just completely failed. Right now, there are efforts underway at the ITU, in the UN, um, between Europe and the US. My view is, at the end of the day, you are going to have, in a lot of cases, two, at least two jurisdictions that can claim authority over any given act. We're like a multinational botnet. You're going to have like 29. <laughs> right, right. Or 300. Right. Yeah, or any, any one of which, because I mean, you've got Clearly, because the, the principle of criminal law is if you're in Canada and you shoot across the border and you kill me in New York, New York has jurisdiction over that, even though it was a Canadian citizen and the, the crime started in Canada. So already, even in the virtual world, I mean, in the real world, you have the notion of transborder crimes. Um, clearly, the drug trafficker in Latin America who's sending drugs to the United States is committing a crime under U.S. law and it can be investigated and if we can get our hands on him or get him extradited, he can serve time in U.S. jail. So in the case of the botnet, if you have victims in a hundred countries, every single one of those countries potentially has jurisdiction. And perpetrators. Well, I'm well thinking, or perpetrators. Or I'm right. thinking a situation right. where, let's say, Yahoo <coughs> France detects a cyber threat Yahoo detects a cyber threat originating in France. They share it with DHS, and uh, all the European agencies and go ape over it and and throw everybody in Yahoo France in the clink and sue them for everything they can yeah. get, kind of thing. So these issues, we are not close. We, the global internet community, are not close to resolving. My view is that part of the answer has to be at least a rough harmonization of legal standards among countries, both in terms of the definition of that which is a crime as well as the definition of what are the regulatory and investigative powers of the governments. You see a little bit of that in the Council of Europe Cybercrime Treaty. You see a little bit of that in some of the uh, human rights courts. There's one for Latin America. There's one for Europe, which are both quite strong. There's actually now one for Africa, which is just beginning to, to take off, but beginning to think about what are the powers of governments, even just within our own nation state. But if you have roughly equivalent relationships and roughly equivalent rules, then you begin to get mutual trust between the countries 
in cooperating, you've obviously got countries that fall outside of the bounds in terms of what they consider to be a crime and in how they interact with their citizens. And I think we need to have a push generally for raising the standards rather than thinking that lower even them. if even if the European definition of the crime was comparable to the US definition of the crime, the response in terms of sharing information with governmental entities, may, they may not be real comfortable with Yahoo sharing with DHS um, because they would rather have it sent to whatever EU <coughs> system it is because they consider it a UA, EU privacy thing. Right, right. But you've got content that's all, content delivery networks are all over the world. Oh, I understand that. I yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's the conundrum. And, and up till now, <coughs> Europe has taken a relatively geographical approach in its approach, certainly to privacy. And they have this notion that data regarding Europeans are collected within Europe can stay within Europe, but should not flow to other countries without equivalent privacy protections. And then you ask, well, how does that work in a, in a cloud uh, context? So again, even just trying to answer these questions for the US within the construct of the US law is very, very uh, difficult. Um, and then, which, let me, um, companies, of course, again, one of the goals here is to protect companies against legal liability. So the statute has a immunity clause, which has been one of the sort of essential elements uh, of, of, the, of the legislation. No criminal or civil cause of action shall lie or be maintained in federal or state court. Can't even file it. I mean, it's not a good faith defense. It's not a defense. You don't get a motion to dismiss. It just you can't even bring the case. Immediate dismissal, in essence, of any case, although they do say acting in good faith, so that does open some question there, for using cybersecurity systems to identify or obtain or for decisions made for cybersecurity purposes based on cyber threat information identified under this. So now you're getting immunized not only for collecting the data and for sharing the data, but acting on the data with no limitation at all for decisions made. And we've at least raised the concern that this opens wide the hack back possibility. Um, what can I do now, not only protecting my system, not only sinkholing traffic, but reaching back into the computer of the originator? And let's assume I can trace it back a couple hops, or maybe even just going to the innocent user, um, innocent intermediary in a multi-stage attack. <coughs> Very, very hard questions. I mean, just think about um, remote wiping. Is it lawful or not to go into a, my computer and wipe the data? Now, one level, that's the definition of a cyber crime. On the other hand, if my computer's stolen, I should have the right to reach into my computer and wipe my data. Now, what if what's stolen from me is some of my intellectual property? Can I go and claw back or wipe out or render that intellectual property useless? Well, that, that's the whole point of those um, data files that expire after a certain date. So certainly I could have the right to, to quash my own data. What if my data now has been incorporated into some other product or into some other data, can I now reach in and destroy that which is incorporated 
my intellectual property. So even just this question of remote wipe, oh, of course, if my phone is stolen, I'm definitely going to wipe it. Um, if it's a corporate phone and I turn it back in when, my, when I leave the company, they're going to wipe all my stuff off of it. Um, but very, very hard then to start going through each one of these possibilities and trying to translate it into legislative language. And you end up instead with some of these very broad terms being used, making decisions for cybersecurity purposes. No civil or criminal cause of action shall lie for decisions made for cybersecurity purposes. Also, by the way, we talked about should the government be inserting its box into a private network? Um, no civil or criminal cause of action shall lie for using cybersecurity systems to identify or obtain threat information. Um, does that mean that the government can come to a private sector entity with its box, say, insert my box, it will identify or obtain cyber threat information. I'm not really going to tell you what's inside the box because, of course, it's classified, and you're not really going to know what's coming back to me over the box um, because that's classified too. Uh, uh, but now you are immune for using the cybersecurity system to identify or obtain threat information and for sharing it in accordance with the section, which means you can share it back to the Department of Justice for cybersecurity purposes. Um, but um, the private entity now is, I don't know, are they, do they lose their incentive to start asking questions about what box goes into, because they're acting in good faith. So, <laughs> We've raised these questions. Uh, we've gotten some traction on them. There's an effort in the bill, actually, to say that there's no new authorization to install government boxes on private sector networks. Uh, there was an effort to try to say that decisions made does not include hackback, but it's pretty broad language and pretty powerful language at the beginning of the, the provision. So the question on that, <laughs> Just getting the mic here, we have a... Yeah, so um, in those previous examples, there, we talked about the hack back there, and so does that mean... Uh, uh, well, how does that relate there to some of the concerns raised that this language that uh, allows the people who are supporting uh, SOPA last year, that they get what they wanted but they weren't able to there when the Stop Online Piracy Act did there fail to get through Congress. And there was an effort to uh, address that question as well in the definition of um, cyber threat, which is to say that cyber threat information um, obtain or identify cyber threat information does not include information solely involving violations of consumer terms of service or consumer licensing agreements. So there was an effort at least, whether it was successful or not, an effort on the part of the drafters of the legislation to say we are not backdooring a SOPA PIPA type regime into this legislation, because that was clearly raised right at the beginning. Earlier definitions did talk about threats to intellectual property, for example, as being a cyber threat. And clearly, theft of intellectual property is a cyber threat, and it's one of the major reasons why we're worried about this problem. So again, it illustrates the, well, when is the theft of intellectual property a cybersecurity problem, and when is it just, quote unquote, just an intellectual property 
problem. And the drafters at least tried to say, we're not talking about copyright infringement. We're talking about theft of intellectual property. But of course, for years, the content industry has said that copyright infringement is theft. And at some level, it is. So again, this is the difficulty which you face in trying to say, oh, we're talking about cybersecurity. We're not talking about SOPA PIPA. It's easy enough to say that. This is, and it's easy enough to say this is not SOPA PIPA by a different name. You know, some of the early rhetoric said, CISPA, son of SOPA PIPA. The proponents of, of CISPA hated that and said, no, no, no. That's not what we're doing here. But to say it and then to try to write it in legislative language is a totally different matter. Very, very hard. Very, very hard to both say what you want, make it relatively timeless, and by relatively timeless, I mean hope that it'll last for about 10 years, um, and you know, not get into sort of mumbo jumbo where you're sort of ending up tying yourself in knots. And I don't think we're there yet. It's been a long, long, long process. I mean, as you know, this issue's been pending now for three or four years. It's remarkable. I mean, at least the president, you know, with an executive order, the executive order, I think, is relatively clear. Now, there you had the benefit that, A, he wasn't trying to do everything. He was only addressing discrete issues. B, nobody had a vote on it. Yeah, another question on liability. So it says here there that the exemption is based upon the use of shared inf information. So um, in our discussion before, we talked about their general best practices, their information that you generate yourself, and you use techniques there like sinkholing traffic there for that. How does this legislation, since they pertain there to those particular best practices, as opposed to those are that are those the the liability that they're from getting that information, they're from a third party. Right. Good question, and it really does not address that question. This is an interesting example of where a particular idea becomes sort of the focal point of the legislative process. Um, and in this case, information sharing. Government to private sector, private to private, private to government. That became sort of the focal point of policy making. And clearly, there, to, to my view, there is a legitimate concern there. And what you do with your own generated information, how the terms of service work, how the contracting process works, how the peering process works, those are questions that people said it is working well enough for now. But there appeared to be this impediment. And we at least came to the conclusion that yes, there is some grounding in reality here that you look at the law and the law seems to prohibit sharing of traffic data or payload data, because we're talking about payload here in the case of an attack, sharing of communications data, the law currently inhibits what I think even from a civil liberties perspective we would say would be legitimate information sharing. And so therefore, just on that relatively narrow issue, members said, okay, let's try to come up with a solution to that. We drafted one at CDT where we actually didn't say notwithstanding any other law. We said we're going to list the laws that are the problem. And there were some specific laws under ECPA, Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and there was the antitrust law. Those are really the two, and there's a provision in the Communications Act. So there were three 
specific sections of the law that we had identified that could present problems. And we said, let's amend just those three, and let's focus on the peer-to-peer -peer sharing so that the private companies can talk to each other to build up their defenses. Um, one company is seeing something, they've quarantined it off, they've dealt with it on their own, but they genuinely want to share it with their competitors um, because they also want their competitors to share with them. And they want to have the quid pro quo of an informal one-to-one -one or within a sector sharing of information. We felt that was legitimate and should be facilitated. Don't get mixed up in the countermeasures debate. That's a much harder one. Don't get mixed up in the what goes to the government debate. That's a much harder one and more freighted with constitutional implications. Just facilitate that peer-to-peer -peer sharing and we can make some real progress in that area. That view was rejected, um, unfortunately, I believe, because I think we could have had progress on this issue two years ago. Instead, it got gridlocked last year and it may be headed for gridlock this year. Um, any one of these problems, when you drill down in, it gets real complicated real fast. The equities get real complicated. Certainly, my motto is think comprehensively, act incrementally. Um, and I think here, even on this issue, you can see, in my view, they went a little too broad and they ended up getting into problems. But uh, again, I, I welcome other thoughts. Yeah. A little bit earlier, a little bit earlier, you mentioned something about being able to modify or block traffic, uh, and sinkhole was given as an example. I consider that to be a block. What would be an example of where they'd want to modify traffic? I'm I'm concerned that this is making opportunities for man in the middle attacks and things of that yeah. sort. Yeah, exactly. One one case would be um, putting some kind of beacon in, um, let's say, outbound traffic to figure out where it's going. Um, attachment stripping on email, for example. What about attachment yeah. stripping out of email? Stripping attachments on email. So that might be an incoming modification. Um, you might, you know, I, I think, in fact, this is practice now, which is you will strip off the attachment, say we had an email from coming to you, it had an attachment, we haven't delivered the attachment, do you want the attachment or not? Then you can have that kind of a... a yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, there are legitimate mm -hmm. modifications. Yeah. A little different in terms of the modification of the outbound traffic, but there is some of that. Again, obviously you can tag your own property and search for it at least on public sites and the, the music industry clearly does that and that's legitimate tactic to find out where copyrighted uh, material is showing up on on private sites on um, publicly available sites i mean um, separate question about sort of phone home type beacons um, maybe legitimate um, obviously people use web beacons um, all the time an email that reports back at least some information about when an email has been opened up or certain content has been viewed. So um, that can be used for um, simple analytic purposes or it can be used for protection of intellectual property or for other defensive protective purposes. Trying to sort of catalog and develop a taxonomy of all of these is is hard. Partly because, and this is a trouble that a lot of policy making in this field faces, people aren't necessarily eager to talk about everything they're doing for understandable reasons. But that then makes it hard to try to come up with the words that define the good stuff you want to permit without authorizing bad stuff that you would worry about but you fall back on things like decisions made. Um, can I, can I, a yeah. comment in, in that area? Yeah. Is <coughs> technically the way, way, you, way you deal with these kind of problems is you, you tighten up your description language. 
Um, and so your, your nouns and your verbs become better and better defined. Um, that process is pretty well known technically. It, it's evolved into a number of description languages. Um, and that basically is the way we define the rules that the internet runs on. Uh, we build protocols. Those protocols are state description languages. Um, and so you're trying to um, suggest, it seems to me, that, that a set of very abstract words and concepts can be used to describe a very detailed system. And, and my feeling is that that's basically impossible. Any good processor um, will figure out where the holes are and, and use them for whatever the interests are. So as I see it, the system that you're using to solve the problem doesn't work. There are, and there are better systems that you could use to solve the problem. Uh, why don't you write these languages in, in some state description language? I would love to be able, I would, I, at some level, I would love to do that. Um, the pushback that we've gotten, uh, the pushback we've gotten is, oh, that'll be outdated in a year. Or, oh, that's too specific. Well, obviously, too specific, if that's considered pushback. Um, I, it sounds to me quite silly. They, if it's too specific, that's wonderful. Um, I, 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 no, I, if it constrains, in terms of being too specific, it, if it constrains the protective measures so that they are ineffective against the evolving threats, then too specific is not a good thing. I, I, the first answer would be, of course. The second answer would be, we always build systems so we can rev them. We do, but the government doesn't. Well, if you write it in a high-level language, you can rev it. That's their high-level language in front of us. Uh, but, but it's ba basically, you know, it's got all kinds of live locks and deadlocks. It doesn't work. Well, an another issue is is the longevity thing that, that you were talking about earlier, that we try and make legislation that will last optimistically 10 years. And um, if, you know, the more specific it is, the more likely it is to be something that, uh, you know, a small te technological change may, may render the whole thing vastly obsolete. Well, no, I, I, I disagree with, it certainly may render it in unworkable in that situation. But it, it, it basically is a set of rules that constrain a set of behaviors. And OK, those rules will constrain those behaviors. Somebody comes up with another behavior, add a new rule. Um, that's not good or bad. That's just life. Congress isn't very efficient at adding new rules. Uh, yeah, well, if, if, things get ba if things get bad enough, they, they tend to. Um, but I don't see where you're making, it doesn't make sense to me. You, you, you're well, trying to describe, design a way of controlling something that's very specific that it's trivial to get around. Somebody just sits there, the lawyer says these words mean this, the engineer says this is a code that does that, and they get it done. Well, you're using the pronoun you, I think, to refer to them. Well, to, to refer to anybody who wants to break the system. I didn't write this, and I didn't, I didn't endorse it. I tried to do what you are suggesting. <laughs> um, we, we tried to do what you are suggesting, and it was, in some respects, rejected. Now, there is other language in these bills that do talk about what is a threat. Um, and they try to define what is a threat as a way of defining that which can be identified and shared. But uh, one of my major purposes tonight was, I think I've achieved, in that you understand what is the difficulty facing Washington? And I think what is the difficulty facing policymakers? Now, one, one, answer, one partial answer that I have here was, what we are trying to do, we're not trying to make everything clear. We're only trying to make some things clearer. So there are some things now which are clearly illegal there's some things which are clearly permitted, and then there's a gray zone. There will always be a gray zone. If we can expand the clarity on either side, that which is clearly permitted, that which is clearly prohibited, 
we're not solving every problem, and we can't solve every problem. I think always the effort to solve every problem ends up leaving you worse off um, in this kind of an environment. So there is a possibility of using specificity if you're only talking about the authorizing side, so you expand the clarity of that which is authorized. Everything that doesn't make your specific list then remains in the ambiguous category, which isn't the worst thing in the world. But what you've done is, is you've created the space for clarity and for assurance and, and um, basically for certainty. So th there is a value, notwithstanding the outdatedness rule, there's a value to saying, okay, we will authorize these things. This will last 10 years. 10 years from now, people will still be doing these things. There may be new things that they want to do that are in the uncertain zone. Maybe we will deal with them in a timely fashion. Maybe they won't. But at least we've given clarity and we've moved some things from the gray zone into the zone of certainty. So that's one way to sort of break the gridlock between it needs to um, work forever, and which forces you to broad terms, versus it's not clear, we need to be more specific. So if you give up on perfection, you can at least then achieve clarity for some things. That's been my approach to the legislative process, but that's not everybody's approach. Uh, one observation when you started is, it seems that the premise of all that is that the government is doing a better job at cybersecurity than anybody else because security has always been the job of government historically. Uh, but cybersecurity is a little bit reverse. It's mainly at the moment run by vigilant and the government is starting to get into it. Uh, even the army is starting to you know, build defense and, and look at it. So I have the feeling that the legislative body is thinking that the government is better at it than anybody else. That's why they have to tell the rest of the world how to do it. So that's the first thing. The problem of sharing, I think, in the uh, security, cybersecurity world, everybody is sharing on a peer-to-peer -peer and you know thread because you know somebody. And the way I see it is a problem of uh, scaling. We can't scale this sharing of information. We can't scale except outside of a few contacts. And when you're looking at the you know, worldwide, you've got a threat coming from anywhere. And who, do, who do you know there that can help us? And that's the kind of things. And my last comment is also, I see that all these things look like to be built out of frustration. That we would like to arrest the bad guy, but we can't do it. So we are going to create some very wide ranging laws that will allow us to catch them because they didn't report to the IRS correctly, like we caught Al Capone, for also a reason, but because if we do it, if we do lose the law wide enough, then we'll find something to arrest somebody. Well, you know, I think that um, a starting premise, again, is, is that the government has a lot more to do to protect its own networks. And it has a hard enough time doing that and doing it successfully. Um, we feel that the private sector should be primarily responsible for protecting the private sector networks. Uh, there does, there is, in my view, clearly room for cooperation at the least. And some things. I've come to the conclusion that there are some things that the government is better at than the private sector. Certainly if you're talking about um, understanding the methods of foreign government attackers or state-sponsored attackers, it's my assumption, at least, and it's certainly the assumption, I would say, of 99% of the people in Washington, my assumption that the government has some unique insights into that. 
And then the question is, how do we allow the private sector to benefit and augment its resources <coughs> based upon the special insights that the government might have due to certain capabilities that the government has that are not available to the private sector? Yeah, so back to your, your, your comment there about the optimum solution, there would be to uh, develop language there that allowed there for their, the um, expansion there, of, of, well, of, of defining what is allowed, okay, there. So, and then there you have on a continuing basis there, there's an, an area that there that's cloudy. There, I think there that what the the um, concern is there for the CISPA legislation as it is right now as passed by the House there is that there it in fact there even though there that it, it clearly has a s s section there which allows more there it now has created um, in, in areas that were not allowed before there are now in the cloudy area, and that's where there is, there is, especially in the personal privacy area, there that that is what there the objection is basically there going forward. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. So, um, I mean, only to restate it, but in an effort to create certainty, they've created a new area of uncertainty, possibly shielded by this language. So, before I ask more questions, we kind of devolved into Q and A. No, that's good. Do you have more material to present? Well, I really no, no, no. I had basically one way or the other said pretty much everything I wanted to say. So. Okay, because I had a question about something much earlier. Yeah. Which was you, you talked about Google going to NSA when they detected that they were probably being attacked from China, I think it was, um, and that that seemed like the right thing to do. But then a little bit after that, you talked about that DHS was really the, the, the front end for the civilian internet, the, you know, kind of the right. So it, should Google have gone to DHS instead of NSA? And, and you know, was, was that so this is, yeah, this is one of the sort of critical uh, dilemmas that we face here, which is the widely held view uh, in industry that the real expertise lies at NSA and not at DHS. That Congress created DHS, explicitly gave it critical infrastructure protection, uh, cybersecurity responsibilities, um, arguably did not give it enough funding, uh, did not give it enough authority to hire expertise. A lot of the resources have flowed to NSA, which always had a certain capability and a clear uh, responsibility for cybersecurity. Um, DHS had a very hard time under the prior president as well as under this president of getting and retaining uh, the assistant secretary uh, responsible for cybersecurity, a uh, very difficult time getting the talent. They, in one positive step, there is now an MOU between DHS and NSA that NSA is sending some of its experts over to DHS. Uh, it's certainly my view, it's been my view that we need, you know, how did we get into this hole where the best cybersecurity resources in the country all work for the military, and yet we've got 90% of the internet owned and operated by the private sector. And we need, yes, we need a robust cybersecurity capability on the military side, but we need to f put resources and the kind of hiring flexibility and the kind of expertise 
into building up a cybersecurity capability in the DHS. Right now, I think most companies would say, if we've got a real problem, we would want to talk to the people at NSA rather than the people at DHS. What agency at DHS would you even think it for? What agency at DHS? So there is a directorate for cybersecurity. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And there is U.S. CERT. So there is U.S. CERT, which now has been brought more directly, to my understanding, under sort of federal ownership, sponsorship. So the Carnegie Mellon CERT is now more expressly part of the federal cybersecurity function. And they obviously play a very significant role. I think with a Google event, I think it was the end of a, of a process more than the start of one. My feeling is that they must have been talking already and it was just the, you know, just formalizing things. Um, I think also there was another event where uh, Obama called several um, uh, CEO of uh, infra, uh, a critical infrastructure and then show them some information just to make them aware this is what's happening, this is what we know. No, go back and look for it and protect your, your infrastructure. So it doesn't stop people from saying, hey, you should look at these things. You know, look here, there's something. What is it? I don't know, just look here. It could be interesting. It's, it's a feeling that's happening on the, on the security. So this, this issue of, um, you know, kind of a neat segregation between NSA handling military stuff and uh, Department of Homeland Security handling, you know, quote, civil stuff, uh, I think becomes problematic. If you, I, I, I read the unclassified version of the Pentagon, you know, annual summary uh, to the Congress on, on China, and it seems that there's at least one, uh, you know, national entity that has chosen to, to blur that line, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is looking at, uh, you know, denial of information as a, a force multiplier, to use a military term, that might even supplant uh, the need to take military action and certainly sees it as a way of uh, leveling the playing field uh, when it comes to the a parity with uh, the United States and its Western allies' military technology. So in, in that kind of scenario where just, you know, the tactical edge network and, and you know, there may not even be a, a, an active hot battlefield, but uh, civilian installations, not just nuclear power plants, but power generation facilities, water distribution systems, lots of systems that are information dependent and that could cause, you know, real damage and actually even threaten lives. Uh, it, it just seems to me it's going to be incredibly difficult to sort that out, particularly when you move from kind of the reactive mode, which is what this seems to be um, uh, you know, slanted towards, to something that actually attempts to be prophylactic in nature right. and preventative in nature. Um, you see any way forward of kind of cracking that nut? Yeah, that is about the hardest uh, question there is. Um, which is why I say it should be a question of leadership, not of exclusive ownership. So civilian leadership for the civilian resources, military leadership for the military resources, but clearly we need to find a way to um, cross-fertilize. And that's why I said I, I was genuinely excited when I heard about the DIB program. Mm -hmm. Because to me, that seemed to be at least the beginnings of a way to promote cooperation without dominance. Um, and to take those insights into the, uh, take China as an example, which is example number one, into the way that the Chinese are operating and where they're going. So clearly we have a, there's a counterintelligence role 
and then you translate that into the prophylactic protective role, I think the protective actual implementation of the protective function on a day-to-day -day basis, still I want to see that lie with the private sector and with the civilian agencies. Now again, it's never going to be, I guess it's never going to be a, a clear line, I guess. Yeah, I, I, what, what I would like to see the government take leadership is in, in you know, precisely at least what the Department of Commerce is talking about in establishing uh, a conversation with the industry uh, that's two-way. Uh, they're getting input from the industry about, or the civil sector, about what concerns them. Uh, but then rather than this, this kind of inform, um, uh, the kind of information sharing scenario that, that you're concerned about, um, one in which the government you know, takes leadership in establishing best practices. Because when you, when you try to make that transition from intrusion detection to intrusion prevention, it's very, very difficult. Very difficult to administer, usually lots of false uh, positives, lots of human intervention required. Uh, to make the system work, and I'm sure you know they have expertise that would you know really help the industry manage themselves better. Right, I agree. I agree entirely. And I think one of the things that a little bit um, skewed that debate or prevented that debate from happening or that process from moving forward was again this fear of regulation and. Um, I think that the administration has put that off the table, although there remains this, as you know, this very uh, deep-seated distrust of the administration and of the president in some quarters. But I think the administration has been pretty explicit that they don't want to go down that road and that the kinds of best practices that they are talking about are truly best practices and are not mandates. Um, because I think if you take away the fear of regulation, then you can have this talk about best practices as truly being best practices in a much more, you know, open way where the barriers are not up because of fear of, of regulation. In some ways, though... Oh, it Going back to the slide that's on up in front of us for liability, if the government mandates what the best practice is, um, how do you avoid that becoming a liability issue for those people who decide that they know better or, or are neglectful? That's right. And it's not as if, it's not as if there are, you know, it's not as if there is n zero liability. So to take one example, um, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has, be, has for the past four or five years now made security a theme. Now, it's adopted what I call the really stupid rule. If you do something really stupid with somebody's private data, they will find you in violation or they will allege that you violated the FTC Act. So, you know, in the famous case, if you have a wireless network in your store that sends the credit card data from the cash register to the back office over Wi-Fi unencrypted so that the bad guy sitting in the parking lot can intercept the credit card numbers while they're passing over your Wi-Fi network. That's really stupid and that is an unfair trade practice in the eyes of the FTC which will get you in some degree of trouble. Penalties are not terribly high, but so that's sort of, you know, so again, we have the things that are really clear over here and the things that are really clear over here, and then we have the gray area. They've been sort of building up the really clear that this is really stupid, and if you do it, it's an unfair trade practice. Um, so it's not as if there's zero liability. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, recently we came back on BCP38 with the uh, big DDoS, you know, uh, anti-spoofing of packets. And that has existed for years and nothing happening. So 
uh, I guess people will be tempted to regulate. Again, that's sort of the, you know, we've had a hard time saying what's, how much security is good enough security. You know, somebody once said, the great thing about standards is there are so many of them. So, you know, which of these standards is the one that you are supposed to follow? And if you follow it, you will be at least protected from liability. Um, finding out, again, I, I, we talk about best practices, but do you agree with me that best practices can devolve into that which we are already doing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But which now has some, kind of, has some kind of industry sanction to it, has been designated a best practice, you know, and there are lots and lots of people who spend lots and lots of time going to standards bodies just to make sure that the way their company is doing it is written into the standard. Um, so, although that won't stop the same thing from happening in the regulatory process. So if you have a regulatory process, you will have lots of people trying to game that as well. Um, I have a, a question about the origins of Sorry, question about the origins and objectives of cyber threats. So far today, we've talked about cyber threats as if, frankly, it's sort of one monolithic thing. Right, right, right. But it seems to me that obviously people gravitate to, oh, maybe it's a, a foreign government trying to attack the US inf critical infrastructure. But cyber threats, I think, are, are so many different things. And implicitly, in all this legislation and so on, are, are people really thinking about cyber threats as one thing or well, many different things? I'm, so I'm laughing because uh, this is precisely a problem that we're grappling with at CDT. Um, and we're trying to write a paper, not dissimilar from the ISOC paper that uh, Paul referred to, but um, what is cybersecurity? Now, you think it's bad here in the domestic debate, in the international debate, and the way that cybersecurity was discussed at the ITU in Dubai in December, there it was everything. And you've got sort of the Russian view of information security, which basically means thou shalt not criticize the government, um, to you know, intellectual property, to spam, to critical infrastructure, to cyber war. So there are many, many, many different terms that are used under the cybersecurity umbrella. And unfortunately, to some extent in the United States, but even more seriously in the global forums, um, that term is used to cover a host of different visions. I mean, here, what has driven the national debate, what has driven the national debate is, quite simply, the rising fear of, of China's capabilities. Not only the capabilities, but their actual current practices. And you know, the Mandiant report um, came out just uh, a couple of weeks before CISPA passed and um, looked in many ways aligned with the vision that many of the members of Congress had about what is the nature of the threat uh, that we're talking serious, serious theft of intellectual property, serious, serious capabilities in terms of disruption of critical infrastructures. So has, C oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. has CDT looked at the way that cybersecurity legislation as implemented through HIPAA um, is or is not a good approach? That's interesting. So, um, and, and let's make this the last question if we could, and I'm happy to stay around afterwards, but we're getting to the uh, bottom of the hour here. Um, HIPAA basically has two pieces to it. It has a privacy piece and it has a security piece to it. The privacy piece um, is most popularly embodied, or we encounter it all the time when we sign that form at the doctor's office, 
agreeing to whatever practices the doctor has for use of our data, and we're thereby consenting to them. Um, the security piece, people have paid less attention to, I think, and I have to say, I'm not actually sure how it has worked. The two, two areas where we have clear federal regulation of security practices are under the Graham Leach Bliley banking law, financial services law, and under HIPAA, um, both of which have security rules, which talk of technical, physical, personnel, and administrative um, practices that must be adopted. It's a great question, though, about what are the lessons learned, either from the financial services industry, which I think has by and large done a good job, although they still get hit, but huge effort, obviously, has gone in there. Um, interesting question. For a long time, of course, for hospitals, the biggest threat was the insider threat in terms of um, nurses or others or doctors or whoever browsing and um, or carelessly handling uh, portable media uh, kinds of issues. But it would be very interesting to have sort of a case study of what has been the effect of clear regulation and have the regulators actually managed to contribute or have there been other drivers and I would say in the financial services arena, I mean, there have been huge drivers in terms of liability and uh, just market-type drivers as opposed to the regulatory drivers. But that would be a fascinating study. Um, we should get Deirdre Mulligan over at Berkeley or somebody to get some grad students working on this or somebody at Stanford working on, on that. I like that question a lot. I don't have the answer, but it's, it's great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll have another piece of pizza and stay around for a bit um, if anybody uh, wants to pursue anything else. But uh, it's been really great, and I appreciate the different perspectives, which uh, help me stay grounded in reality, because um, this is very, very hard stuff and sometimes can easily get divorced from reality. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim, for a really uh, lively discussion. And thanks for everyone uh, who's joining us in the live stream uh, webcast and who may uh, enjoy this from the uh, live stream archives later on.